Last week I preached um, <clears throat> Matthew 13 of the four soils. Uh, it's basically a message of salvation. How prepared are you in your heart to receive the Lord? If you are prepared to receive the Lord, His grace is sufficient. His salvation, so abundant and free, can come in and change your life. That word that I love so very much, to the uttermost. We sang it this morning. I'm grateful that I, He doesn't come just to give us a little, a little dab, you know, the old the old commercial, a little dab will do you. No, no, he's come to give us so much more. All of heaven is access to us. All of his grace, all of his goodness, all of his love. And I am so very grateful. But today I'm going to continue that thought. We're going to continue with uh, the parables of Jesus. And we're going to uh, touch uh, the next parable in Matthew 13. But I, I thought it important today for us to pick up a parable that's missing in Matthew 13, and it's in uh, Mark chapter 4. Uh, it actually follows the one um, <clears throat> that is in the, the parable of the souls in Mark 4, but it's actually in uh, Mark 4 verse 26, okay? Because we're going to be using two different scriptures, I'm only going to make you stand for one. Is that fair? So all who can and are willing, would you stand with us in honor of reading God's Word? Mark chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse number 26. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. We're saying, come Lord Jesus, just know that he is coming. The harvest is coming. The fields are widened to harvest. We just need to be ready. And as Matthew 10 says, we need to pray that the Lord would send forth laborers into the harvest. We need a harvest. Uh, I agree with the comments that you made, Lee, about the Gen Z, these young people. I am, if y'all know me, y'all know how extremely uh, hopeful I am for that generation. They have seen the mess that we've made in my generation. Uh, they have felt the effects of divorce and and, and, and spending and chasing after riches and fame, and they know that it is empty. They know that it is counterfeit. They, they have seen it. They have seen the brokenness, and they want more. Praise God with Jesus, they'll find more. Now, I understand that in this generation, this young generation, they're extremely impressionable. I know that. I know that it's sad when students at Columbia University start something that's actually crossed our country just to show hatred. Hatred. Bigotry and hatred. And as soon as we think that we got all that behind us, Satan pulls it out again. But just understand this and know, there's a lot of those young people that are confused, but they don't represent all. I love their passion. We just need their passion for Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for what you have done generation after generation, continent after continent. Lord, city and country, rich and poor. Lord, uh, educated, uneducated, it does not matter. You love us with a love that is so abounding and so good. Jesus, you are so willing to pay the price. My Father, you were so willing for him to come and to go through all the pain so that we could have a salvation so rich and free. Lord, we do take it for granted. I pray that we don't take it for granted, but I pray, Lord, that we get it right. So in the moments that are ahead, may we look to your Scripture, may we know, may we believe, may we trust May we listen to you today. And Jesus, send the Spirit, oh, come. In your name we pray, 
Amen. You may be seated. I wanted to bring in this parable in Mark 4 as well. It's, it's short. It's uh, very upfront. It's easy to understand. And it's a promise that you need to hold to and keep. Are y'all, are y'all good with that? It is a confirmation that we must understand that God is at work. He says the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Now, in this particular translation, in, in this particular phrase, it's, it's exactly like it was last week. The, we come with the seed of the Word of God, of salvation, and we scatter it. Last week, we talked about the four different types of soul, the four different types of heart. But let me just say this. For those who do receive it, it is kept by the power of God. And they will produce fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. And one of the things about us is we like to, we like to make sure that we're going to do it. And those people are usually frustrated in their Christianity. Understand the work of Christ is the work of Christ. It's His work. It's He who brings the life. It's He who brings the joy. It's He who produces, listen, <clears throat> Himself in us. That's a great thing. We can't do that. But He can, and He's willing. So look what it says. If, he, if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and he just goes to sleep at night, Not one amen? I'm used to it. I kind of like it. I'm kind of glad that every day, some days you just want to put a period on. Amen? Just put it behind you. And, and, and go to bed and God's going to do something and you're going to wake up with a new outlook the next day. You know, uh, that, that great wisdom of those who went before us said just take it, go to bed at night and tomorrow will be a brand new day. But while we are asleep at night, that does not mean God is asleep. That not, does not mean that God is not at work. Matter of fact, the work of God continues around the clock, around the globe. Everywhere the sunshine shines, the, the work of God's grace is there. Praise God, we can just leave it in His hands. Now, some of you may go to bed at night wondering how you're going to change the world, how you're going to solve the problems. How many of y'all have ever done that? How many of you have loved ones you just like to, to fix them? I know, I know. And we can't sleep because, because we've got so much that we want to see happen and so much that... Y'all control freaks. I am too. I am too. <clears throat> but we just go to sleep at night and we rise by day and the seed will sprout and grow. Man, I like to see growth. I, I, I just like to see growth. I got, I got hooked when I was a kid when my dad took me out there and, and taught me how to garden. I didn't know I was just free labor, right? But, but watching it grow was amazing. The first time to go out there and see it when it just comes out of the ground and the blade is pushing up, you know good things are coming, Amen. And what wonders, the first time we go out and we, we pick it and we bring it in, and, and it, I don't know about anybody else, but the, the tomatoes that I grow taste pretty good. And the green beans are none better. Amen? Especially when you've got a wife that can cook like I have. Amen? It's just something good to know, to watch what God does. And sometimes we get discouraged in this world, but can I just share once again that when God's seed finds the heart, God does a new work, a new life, a, a new beginning, 
And it's not because of us, it's because of Him. I don't care if you've messed up a million times. God produces life. Yes? And He says here, the seed should sprout and grow. He Himself does not know how. I don't know how He does it, but I just love it. It says, the earth yields crops by itself. You don't have to help it, it just does it. First the blade, then comes up the head. And after the full, then the, then the head, and after that, the full grain in the head. When the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Church, we've only got one growing season. We've only got one life. We've got one opportunity. We need to live it. We need to live it. Too many people are doing too many different things. You're investing in the wrong places. And you're going to be bankrupt. Wood, hay, and stubble. The things that are here today and gone tomorrow. That's bad investment. Bad investment. You know, sin thrills before it kills. And people are living for the thrill. People are living for this world as if this is our home. I'm just a pilgrim. I live in a tent. I'm passing through. I'm not putting down roots here. Come on. I'm putting down roots there. Look in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. Let me share this. Some people make this parable a very hard parable. The first two parables in Matthew 13, though, Jesus gives us the explanation. Now, a parable is a story that goes alongside. It's a truth there it, that, that you, can, uh, you can see a picture, and it's a picture that has a truth. Okay, but some of them, it, it seems kind of hard, but, but yet he says, let me give you the explanation for it. So if you have your Bibles in Matthew 13, look down in verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Can, can y'all say this word for me? Good seed. Say it again. What should we be taking out today? And uh, I got comments on it this week. Last week I went, whoosh. I don't know if anybody heard anything else I said, but they remembered that one thing. They took the seed and went, whoosh. So what are we supposed to do this week? We're supposed to do some whooshing. For those that are watching online, I apologize, but that's just that way it goes. I don't know if it's in the dictionary, but I know what it means. You take it, you put that seed in your hand, and go. Good seed. Take your poisonous seed and do something else with it. Take your bitter heart and let God cleanse it. Take your critiquing and your criticism and be quiet. Take your anger and your pain and let God heal. But what the world needs today is a good old-fashioned whoosh. Take the seed of Christ and spread it everywhere you go. Y'all good with that? All right. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept. Oh, now before, when we were thinking about all the problems and the troubles, we, we wanted to, to not sleep because we wanted to fix them, but we can't fix them. Only God can produce growth. Amen? You might not like the, like the way God works, but God works perfectly well. God can't do anything except that which is good and right and perfect. It is His nature, okay? But he also has an enemy. Now, and he goes by his nature. His name is Satan. He is full of pride. He began the civil war of disobedience towards God. By the way, he's a loser. And he knows he is defeated. He knows the Word of God better than you do. He's read the last chapter, and he knows that he's not a part of it. He knows the lake of fire is there, and he knows that his name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. His name 
Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels and for all who choose to go there. So, when the good seed has been planted by Christ, the enemy comes in. Listen to me now. Christ's enemy, our enemy comes in, and look what happens. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Let's continue with the story. Verse 26. When the grain had sprouted, and by my goodness, it does. Remember, that's what we Mark 4 said. The blade comes up, and then the, then the seed will come out, and it will, it will grow for the harvest. When the grain has sprouted and produced a crop, then the da- tares that come from the seed of the enemy, they sprout as well, and they appear. So the servants, verse 27, of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Of course they did. Nobody goes out and goes through all that work to say, I'm going to have the greatest weeds in the world. You don't have to work at that. They just come. Amen? He said, uh, did, you sow, did you not sow good seed in the field? How then does it have tares? In our world today, we have tares everywhere. I'll talk more about that in just a second. Verse 28. He said to them, he was aware, he understood, and he knew the ramifications of it. An enemy has done this. Now, you may not like it that God allows evil to happen. God doesn't produce evil. God cannot produce evil. God is good. So how can a good God produce evil? He doesn't. But he does allow it. Now, you might not like that God allows it, but he is perfect and he's never made a mistake. And he, all things work together for good, Romans 8, 28. So just to understand that when God allows something, it means something better is going to happen as well. You don't have to understand it all. You just have to trust the one who never makes mistake. So he says, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? That's that committee of control freaks that want to go out there and say, "Uh, well, they did this and we'll go stop it. Can I just pause and just say, the Lord wants you to serve him and walk with him and to work with him, but he really doesn't need your help. All right, for all of you that are offended by me, I'm going to have to go home and take a half a baby aspirin to get over it. He doesn't need your help. There's only one throne and it's his. Right? And and he doesn't, it, it's not like he's going to come to us and say, Brian, I'm really glad that you came through. I, I, I messed up there. I just allowed that to happen. But you came in and you fixed it. I can tell you one thing, if Brian gets involved, it's going to get messed up. I need to stay with his playbook with the good seed going whoosh. And he'll grow up what needs to happen. And when the enemy's at work, the only one that can defeat the enemy is our Lord. But when he defeats the enemy, there's not one thing that can separate me from the love of Christ. All right? So he says, he said, uh, the servant said to him, did you not want us to go then to go out and gather them up? And he said, no, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. You'll mess it up. Don't do that. Don't do that. Let both grow together until the harvest. There's going to be good and evil in this world until Christ comes. But when he comes, he says, at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them. I don't know that you know this, but Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Jesus came because he did not want people to be separated from him forever. He came to to forgive. He came to grow the beauty of a new life. He puts a smile on his face to see us shine in his radiance of his glory but he'll take care of the others. If they so choose that, 
He'll let them have their choice. But when the harvest comes, please listen. He'll throw in the sickle. He'll gather them first. He'll bundle them up. And they'll go to hell. From hell, they'll go to the lake of fire. That's bad news. The gospel's the good news. But there is bad news for those who don't choose the gospel. But he says, the good news is, but he will also, at the time of the harvest, he will gather the wheat into his barn. You call it heaven, you call it home, you call it whatever it is, but he got, he's gone to prepare a place for me and for all of you who have the same hope in Jesus Christ. Made specifically for you. Tailor-made. I kind of like that. Mine's going to have a rocking chair on it somewhere. Just so I can sit down and watch Rick work a little bit. What's the definition of this? Let's go at it and let's look at it again. Look at verse 37. Let's do this quickly. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. You have a part in it. But the seed, the life of new life, is in the seed, it's what Jesus can produce. He came to produce a new life, a new heart, to make us, as he told Nicodemus, that we can be born again. Jesus does that. We just get the great privilege of taking the seed and going, and going, thank you, thank you. My sermons go a whole lot quicker if you do it the first time. Verse 38, the field is the world. That's where we're supposed to take the seed and do the whoosh. It's the world. And when you scatter it, you don't say, I think I'll put one here and I'm going to save the rest. Oh, there's somebody. I'm going to put one here. No, 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 no. You just do the whoosh. Let it fall where it may. Like we talked about last week, the different souls. You just scatter it for all of them. He'll make what needs to happen, happen. The field is the world. The good seeds are the son of the kingdom. Hey, that's me. The tares are the sons of the wicked one. Do y'all know them? Have y'all experienced the children of the, of the devil? Don't mention their names, we're in church. I mean, there's some people that just, ooh, Aren't you grateful that our Lord is patient, loving, and kind? If I was God, I'd be burning people up left and right. And the problem is, is I'd be messing up left and right. You know, I don't know when the harvest is coming. I got my seed in the ground pretty early. But I'm grateful that some people get planted late. You know, the thing about the field is, is if when we're doing it, it's not just one crop a year. Are y'all good with that? There's things that can grow all year long. God's always at work. I don't think y'all caught that. Let me just say it one more time, just so that you'll know. Whether you know it or not, you go to sleep, you raise up, God's always at work. Always, always at work. The enemy, verse 39, who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Everyone who chooses to not accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord they're going to stand in their own goodness, and that goodness is not enough. They will be gathered. One of the saddest, no, the saddest thing in all of Scripture is when it talks about those that will be separated from God and His love and His peace and His joy forever and ever and ever. And by the way, we have second chances while we're here, but after the harvest, there are no second chances. There are no exit signs in hell. 
God's not going to change his mind. You'll live forever with the choices that you make here. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. Cast them into the furnace of fire. And here's that phrase seven times Jesus used this phrase. Seven times the complete number he used this phrase. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, crying to the place that it's uncontrollable. Have you ever done that? You just can't stop crying. You cry and you cry and you cry and you cry. And, and, and it, have you ever cried to the place that you shook? Have you ever cried to the place that you, you, you were going to about to get sick because you just could not stop cry, crying? And the pain says gnashing of teeth, where you're sitting here grinding your teeth because you're having to endure their pain and there's nothing to come to take it away. I would not wish that on my worst enemy. And here is the problem. Here is the reason why Jesus shared this parable. Because Satan is at work. And Satan is a counterfeit. There is God the Father, there is God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen? At the end of the time, what will be revealed is there will be the Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. He can't even come up with anything original. Everything that, that is good that God did, he has a false for. So we have the church. We've got the body of Christ. But Satan has his synagogue too. We are the believers in God, in Jesus, his Savior. But just like Eve was deceived, Satan will come to deceive others to get them to follow his following. And he always does this by encouraging us, propping us up, telling us that it's about us. Does this not sound like the world? Telling us that our way is okay. But there is a way that seems right unto a man, and the end thereof are the ways of death. Solomon thought that was so important that he said it twice. So Satan is out there with his army, planting weeds. Denari, here's the thing with those. He comes when they're not looking, when they're not expecting it. And in the beauty of God's field, he plants the weeds alongside them. And when they sprout, they sprout it just as well. They grow just as well. And when they grow up, when they're young, they look exactly like the wheat. You cannot tell them apart. It's counterfeit. But listen, a good counterfeit looks like the original, but it has no seed in the head. The work of the new heart that's been placed within them. So the servants came and said, did we not plant good seed? How are there tares out there? The enemy did this. We'll get rid of them. You can't. Now there's two quick things you need to know here. <clears throat> When a wheat grows and matures, it dies down. The roots die down. And the head will bow because of the weight of the seed. As the stalk gets heavy, it has nothing, it, it, it does not care about the earth anymore. It dies down and it bows the head and it's time for the harvest. Church, we need less of the earth, more of God. And the closer we get to the end, that's when we need to humble ourselves and bow down before Him. Because when that happens, we sweeten. But a tear, denari, it may look like 
the, uh, the, the real thing, but as it grows, it grows different, and there is no seed in the head, and it, it's a weed, and you want to reach down there and pull it up. But, but listen, as the wheat dies down and the roots go away, the, the, the tear wants to entangle with the roots of the wheat. So when you pull up the tear, what happens? The wheat will be dislodged as well. He says, leave them alone. Let them grow together. But when the harvest comes, I'll take care of it. I'll take all the tares, all the unbelievers, and, and I'll, I'll gather them up. We'll bundle them up and they'll get what they want. Well, maybe not what they want, but what they chose. Separation from God forever. Weeping, gnashing of teeth. Oh, but the rest. As we die to this earth, the Bible says we're supposed to die daily. The more you die, the sweeter you get. The more humble you get, the more you bow down. Satan has planted his seed quite well. I'm going to say these two words. I think you'll know what I mean when I say them. False religion. Do y'all know any false religions out there? Mm. Now, they sound pretty good sometimes, and that's how they'll get the weak ones in. But they're just making them, as the Bible says, more the sons of hell than they were. And they're everywhere. And once again, he's a counterfeit. So he'll, he'll put a, a, a God to this group of people, and it sounds good to them, and a God to this group of people, and he'll, it sounds good to them, and, and they're everywhere. The thing that is still killing the America today is what we call secular humanism. That means you're, you're following the wisdom of the world, you're following the ways of the world, and you are growing to look like the world, and you're putting your roots down in this world, and you're trying to have, build everything here. You want a kingdom down here. You're going to die with the most money. Come on. You're not going to give it away while you're living. You're not going to invest it in others. You, you, you're, going to, you're going to make sure that you have security. By the way, if you're trusting in Social Security, you're hurting. You better be trusting in eternal security. Where you're in with Christ. In the church. Denominations were made by man. How many heavens are there? How many saviors are there? So all true believers whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, there's not a, a parenthesis at the end of it. It says Baptist. And, and by the way, if you're throwing stones at other people, quit it. Let them grow together and the Lord will take care of it all. It's not your job to go tear down somebody else. The Lord of the harvest can handle it. He doesn't need your help. But the thing about secular humanism is it sounds good because you're following the wisdom of this world. And, and, and Lee, I'm here to tell you, you're going to get persecuted. They're going to call, they're going to call us Oh, they're going to call us. They're going to come up with new names, and I don't care. Jesus said as long as they persecuted him, what are they going to do to us? They're going to persecute us as well. You just keep doing the right thing and bringing honor and glory to God. Amen? They're going to tell you there's two things you're not supposed to talk about. Politics and your faith. And by the way, I'm through talking about politics. I know some of you want to talk with me about it. I'm kind of the same way. Let them grow together, all the elephants and all the donkeys, and just let them grow together, and the Lord's going to have to sort it out. I can't do anything to change it. Though some of y'all are trying them awfully hard, all I know is 
there's only one king that I bow to, and it's King Jesus. I don't care about the rest. I don't trust them. I'm not going to put my faith in them. They've let me down before, but there's one that's never let me down. The church is going to have to stop doing less. We're going to have to stop doing more and, and quit trusting in the government to take care of all that because they have let you down. They will let you down. They can't do anything but let you down. But the king will take care of you. Denominations are us dividing ourselves against others when we need to be kingdom builders. You know, some want to sprinkle, some want to dunk. If you're around me, I'll get you under. If you let Lance dunk you, he'll get you under. His daughter didn't make it all the way, but my goodness, he... Isn't that right, Kaylee? And you, got, you came up with a smile on your face, and I bless the Lord for it. Folks, how people pray, they may pray differently than you. Let's just pray. Amen. And I understand that you love the Lord and you want to defend Him because He means so much to you. But please, please, let's just do the right thing. Traditions, let them go. The only tradition we need is Christ and Him buried and Him resurrected and ascended and we just need to follow that. I'm not against all traditions, but I don't worship them. I was talking to a young lady this week, and she was trying to set me. She thought I got liberal. I didn't wear a coat today. I don't wear a tie today. Now, I don't mind wearing a coat. Y'all seen me wear a coat. Have y'all seen me wear a coat? Right? Shake your head. But I'm, I'm so stubborn, I didn't do it because she said she had her church clothes, and if you were a God-fearing preacher, you had to wear a coat. So old stubborn Brian left his in a closet. <laughs> Y'all okay with that? All right. I didn't find a dress code in the Bible other than I needed to be robed in white. The glory and the holiness of God. Let your traditions go. It's just an anchor. Yesterday, following yesterday, trying to remake yesterday, trying to re-ring a bell that's already been rung, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Gen Z could care less about your traditions. And you're trying to convert them to your traditions, we just need to convert them to Jesus and let them grow them up. Right? Oh, I'm meddling now. Fads come and go. Satan's always got a new fad out there. That person that got on to me about not wearing a coat, they didn't like it that a preacher on TV uh, had paid $2,000 for a sweater. I'm like, if I had $2,000 to buy a sweater, I'd buy one, but I'm not going to. If Goodwill's got a $2,000 sweater there that I can get for a dollar and a half, can I get an amen? <laughs> Satan divides and conquers. Don't let him. What doesn't fit with the world? I don't. I'm sold out to Christ. It's the only... You know, there's a wrench, and a wrench will turn a nut. I'm just grateful that I'm a nut, that Jesus has got His hand on the wrench. If He wants to do a, a change in my life, I'm all for it. He might have to put a little pressure on me, but it works. Salvation is of the Lord. The still small voice will speak to your heart. It will convict you of your sins. You will no longer want to feel the pain of this world, and you will, you will say, I need something new. I need life. I need hope. I need heaven. I need Jesus. And what he's been doing ever since the day of Pentecost, and by I don't know when he's coming, but he'll keep doing it until then, is he'll work with his church, and a great work will be done. I know I've preached long. I preached about like normal, which is long. 
the most important time in all of the service. It's not the singing. It's, it, it's, it's the time of saying yes to Jesus. It's the time if we hear, we say yes. The end of this, Jesus said in the parable, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I'm going to add to that. If you have ears to hear, please say yes to him today.